Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the webinar. My name is Cynthia Thaler, and I'm a program associate at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I've been in contact with each of you and look forward to our continued work together. Before turning to the content of the webinar, I'd like to briefly talk through a couple of housekeeping items about how the webinar is going to work and then take a brief moment to tell you a little bit about the National Reentry Resource Center and the, and the Justice Center's youth program. Anytime during the webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. We will keep a running list of the content-related questions you receive and then ask the panelists to respond to the questions during the last segment of the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many of the questions as possible. If you encounter technical or audio problems during the webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues that, may, that you may not be able to resolve. And for this reason, we'll be recording the event and it'll be posted to our website within a few weeks. Once it's been posted, we will email you a link to the recording. The Council of State Governments Justice Center is a national nonprofit that serves policymakers at the local, state, and federal levels from all branches of government. We provide practical, nonpartisan advice and consensus-driven strategies informed by available evidence to increase public safety and strengthen communities. The Second Chance Act, which was signed into law in 2008, is the first federal legislation passed by Congress to authorize federal support to reentry programs. The bill authorized up to $165 million in federal grants to state, local, and tribal government agencies and nonprofit organizations. In 2009, following a competitive process, the CSG Justice Center was selected to launch the National Reentry Resource Center and provide training and technical assistance to all Second Chance Act grantees. The National Reentry Resource Center is administered by the Council of State Governments Justice Center in partnership with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. Since 2009, nearly 600 Second Chance Act grant awards have been made to government agencies and nonprofit organizations for reentry programs serving both adults and juveniles. Approximately 20% of these grants were awarded to agencies and organizations serving a juvenile justice population. The Justice Center is constantly adding new content and resources to our website and we send out a monthly newsletter that provides information about the latest research, funding opportunities, distance learning events, and other news about reentry. So to sign up for our newsletter, please visit csgjusticecenter.org slash subscribe. On our website, you'll find the juvenile reentry page, which provides the most current information and resources on what works to improve youth reentry and overall juvenile justice outcomes. The Justice Center's youth program provides state and local policymakers with comprehensive research, analysis, and technical assistance that support collaborative and consensus-based strategies that reduce recidivism, improve school discipline practices, and incorporate the behavioral health interventions for youth and their families. Within the Justice Center's youth program, there are two main areas of focus, the School Discipline Consensus Project and the Juvenile Justice Project. The School Discipline Consensus Project is a national initiative to provide policy recommendations for supporting schools that are addressing the impact of suspension and expulsion on students' academic outcomes and, and involvement with the juvenile justice system. The Juvenile Justice Project is focused on helping state and local governments to protect public safety and help youth who are involved with the juvenile justice system become law-abiding, productive adults. Please check out the Juvenile Justice Project page, which provides an overview of this work. You can also learn more about our juvenile justice-related activities and also access seminal publications and resources from the field on juvenile justice-specific topics. In this webinar, we'll walk through the planning and implementation guide that you will complete as a requirement of the planning phase for your 2014 SBA demonstration grant. 
We will discuss the goals and structure of the two-phase demonstration grant program and the purpose of the P&I guide and how to make the best use of it. We'll review all sections of the guide, including key considerations to reflect upon as you complete the guide with your task force. We will then have a 2013 implementation grantee join us to discuss her experience using the guide and also provide some advice based on her experience. We'll then review next steps so that you know what to expect over the next several months. And finally, we'll address some common questions about the guide and answer any questions you may have. So with that, I'll now turn to Josh Wepper, the Director of the Juvenile Justice Program here at the CSG Justice Center, to go over the next section of the webinar and discuss the goals and structure of the two-phase planning implementation grant program. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Cynthia, and thank uh, all of you uh, on the phone, on the webinar with us uh, this afternoon. We appreciate your time and we're excited about this opportunity to partner with you and support your efforts uh, to reduce recidivism for the youth that you serve. There are a number of goals of the two-phase planning and implementation demonstration program. Uh, the, the first key goal, uh, as noted by the, the demonstration program name, is really to test out new strategies to reduce recidivism and improve other youth uh, reentry outcomes. Um, we really uh, like to encourage you to see this grant opportunity as not simply an opportunity to provide additional and better services and supports for youth, but to really test out and evaluate uh, new and improved ways of improving reentry outcomes overall that, if successful, can be applied to a larger population of youth in your systems. A second key goal of the demonstration program is not simply to move forward with testing out the new ideas and strategies that you proposed in your application, but to use this process as well as our technical assistance to identify broader policy and practice opportunity, opportunities to improve the overall reentry process. One of the key reasons why this year's grant program is different than previous year's grant programs and all grantees are required to go through both a planning and an implementation phase is the experience in prior years is that many grantees have proposed uh, well-founded activities to improve reentry outcomes but struggled to implement those activities successfully because there were larger policy and practice barriers to reducing recidivism and ensuring the success of that project. As a result, this year for the first time, all grantees are required to go through a planning phase and we see this as a wonderful opportunity to both prepare to implement your proposed scope of work effectively, but also to identify what those larger policy and practice barriers might be and for us to work with you and support you to develop strategies and plans to address those barriers. Another key change for this year is that the grant program in the past had been only 12 months. For this year's grantees, the grant program is 24 months, which allows for sufficient planning time as well as time to enroll sufficient youth in your reentry programs and uh, services and implement those effectively. The planning phase is up to six months, um, but it is a flexible planning phase and so can be a bit shorter or a bit longer adjusted to where each grantee is in terms of preparing to successfully implement the activities that you proposed. Regardless of how long the planning phase is, the key criteria for transitioning from the planning phase to the implementation phase is really the completion of an implementation and technical assistance plan. 
as we'll talk about through the rest of this webinar, that implementation and technical assistance plan is really developed in partnership with you and the National Reentry Resource Center and is really designed to ensure that you are prepared to meet all of the goals established for this program, which include both successfully implementing your proposed project as well as developing longer and broader plans for how to improve the reentry process overall in ways that sustainably support improved youth outcomes. In support of this new structure, all grantees will receive approximately $50,000 during the planning phase to help support your planning activities. And then once you have successfully completed the deliverables of the planning phase, we'll be able to move forward with the implementation phase upon OJJDP approval and receive the rest of your grant funds. To support your efforts in this process, the National Reentry Resource Center is committed to providing you with ongoing technical assistance. At a minimum, that technical assistance will include monthly calls with you to discuss the development of the key deliverables of the planning phase and to support you to identify and address areas for improvement. During the implementation phase, we will continue that support and can also provide on-site support and training to you to help address those barriers identified during the planning phase and to help you to continue to implement your proposed scope of work successfully. There are a number of specific deliverables during the planning phase. The first key deliverable is the formation of an effective juvenile reentry task force. Hopefully for many of you, you've already started developing that task force or may even have a task force already in place. Based on lessons learned with all of our other grantees, we have found that those task forces can be an extremely useful collaborative body to help guide both your implementation activities and also the identification of other key barriers for reentry and to develop and oversee plans to implement improvements to address those barriers. The second key deliverable is the development of a plan for tracking the recidivism and other youth outcomes associated with your demonstration project. If the goal of the demonstration project is to test out new strategies for reducing recidivism and improving other youth reentry outcomes, it will be critical that you have the capacity or the partnerships in place to be able to track the impact of those efforts and whether youth are being more successful as a result of those demonstration activities. We recognize and appreciate that collecting this kind of recidivism and other outcome data can be very complex, very resource intensive and very difficult for many grantees. And so it's not the expectation during the planning phase that all grantees will have worked out all of the details of that plan but that there will at least be a plan in place and activities underway to ensure that that data can ultimately be collected and analyzed. The next key deliverable of the planning phase is a reentry strategic plan. As noted, your demonstration project should be part of a larger effort to identify barriers and gaps to improving reentry outcomes and developing a plan to address those gaps. The National Reentry Resource Center has spent the past year reviewing all of the rigorous research that's been conducted on what works to reduce recidivism and improve other outcomes for youth in the juvenile justice system, particularly the high-risk youth who end up in facilities and challenges are posed in terms of their reentry back into the community. So a key way that we can support your efforts is sharing this, these resources and research with you and helping to guide you in assessing your current reentry policies and practices and developing a plan to address improvement needs. The next deliverable of the planning phase is a sustainability plan. One of the other reasons why this year all grantees are going through both a planning and an implementation phase is in the past, planning grantees would do wonderful planning, but not necessarily have the resources to support their implementation efforts. 
you will have the opportunity to both engage in planning and have those resources to support your efforts, but we also want to make sure that we begin working with you as early as possible to ensure that your activities, if successful, can be sustained once OJJDP funding is ended. Finally, the culminating deliverable is an implementation and technical assistance plan that identifies your progress around each of these four deliverables, continued challenges, and specific plans and action steps that you will take to address those challenges and ways that the National Reentry Resource Center can continue to support and improve your efforts during the implementation phase. Once grantees successfully transition from the planning phase to the implementation phase, the focus of that phase will be on a number of items. The first, of course, is implementing your proposed scope of work and ensuring the success of that effort. As noted, we also hope that during that process, you use your reentry task force as well as the strategic plan that you've developed to identify and address larger barriers to effective reentry. And finally, a key activity during the implementation phase will be measuring and tracking the outcomes associated with your efforts, using that data to improve your efforts, and sharing that data to get the buy-in and support of leaders within your agency and external stakeholders to continue to support your efforts after the grant period has ended. Each of the deliverables have an associated timeline. Um, as you may have noted in the planning and implementation guide, there are checklists associated with each of these deliverables, and the deadlines note the, the date by which it's our expectation that you will send those completed checklists to the National Reentry Resource Center. As we'll discuss in a bit, of course, it would be easy for you to fill out those checklists and complete them in a matter of days. What we are hoping for during this planning phase and the expectation of the planning phase is not simply that you're completing those checklists, but that you're using it as a process of engaging in critical self-reflection with your agency and with your reentry task force on where you are around each of these deliverables, identifying opportunities to improve your efforts and partnering with us to identify and use resources to help support your reentry improvement needs. I'll now transition things back to Cynthia so she can talk a little bit more in detail about the planning and implementation guide. Great, thank you, Josh. So the P&I guide is a requirement under the OJJDP FY14 Second Chance Act Juvenile Reentry Program solicitation. And the purpose of the guide is to really help you assess your current reentry practices and guide you as you develop your reentry strategy and the set of implementation activities that promote improved reentry outcomes. You use the guide as a tool for continuously assessing reentry policies and practices during and beyond the term of your grant to identify strengths and gaps in reentry policies and practices. It will guide you as you improve your reentry system and sustain those changes over time. The guide will also serve as a foundation for the technical assistance that you'll receive from the NRRC. And as your TA providers, my colleague Elizabeth Siegel and I will work with you and your reentry task force to collaboratively identify a small number of priority policy and practice changes within each section of the P&I guide and to complete the implementation and technical assistance plan accordingly. The guide can be used by your reentry task force and key reentry stakeholders throughout the implementation phase and on an ongoing basis to review your progress and to track the completion status of identified tasks and to ensure that you receive the support that you need from the NRC and other experts. So last year was the first time that the Justice Center created a guide that really mapped to the research on improving outcomes for youth. And this came out of the development of our white paper and data issue brief, which you can find on our website. 
Through the process of developing those materials, we conducted a comprehensive review of the research on what works to improve youth reentry re outcomes. We also drew upon the lessons learned from grantees in the past and worked with experts in the, in the field and also worked with OJJDP to make sure that the guide reflects the deliverables that are outlined in the solicitation as well as the needs of the field. Having piloted last year's guide, we've revamped the planning and implementation guide to really address grantees' needs and help prepare you to successfully complete, uh, to successfully implement your programs based on the research on what works to reduce recidivism and improve youth outcomes. In completing the guide, you'll work with your reentry task force and other key stakeholders to complete each of the checklists and work with your TA provider to review the checklist and the guide and develop a technical assistance plan for the implementation phase of your grant. Your TA provider will also facilitate calls and site visits to assist you with the planning and execution of your proposed scope of work. Completion of the guide will also be an ongoing process and you'll be, uh, and we will, you'll be, you will not be asked to complete the guide all at once. It'll be a step-by-step -step process that will be broken down for you in a systematic way. You'll also work with your task force to review your progress on an ongoing, ongoing basis throughout the term of the grant and beyond. And you can be creative in your use of this guide to develop surveys and trainings and other methods to generate stakeholder buy-in. One of our FY13 implementation grantees is on the call from Palm Beach County, Florida, and she'll talk a little bit about how she used creative strategies to maximize the benefits of the guide. As I mentioned, we piloted a revamped guide, and through that process, we learned some lessons based on grantee experiences. Grantees had the best results when they worked collaboratively with reentry task force members and with other stakeholders to complete the guide. Being as descriptive and detailed as possible also helped us to have a more structured conversation um, so that we can tailor the tech your technical assistance to your needs. And also we want to we want to stress that it'll be to your benefit to be as honest as possible in responding to the questions in the checklist. It's not a test, it's really an assessment. Um, we're not monitoring for compliance, and the purpose of the guide is to assist you in preparing for the successful implementation of the scope of work outlined in your proposal, as well as to identify reentry policy and practice changes that will promote improved outcomes for youth. It will guide you as you develop a reentry strategy and the implementation activities that will advance those strategies. So your honest responses will also help us tailor the technical assistance, uh, your technical assistance to your needs. And lastly, the NRC has a wealth of resources, and we've been working with grantees since 2009, and your TA provider has a wealth of knowledge in this area as well. We're also connected with juvenile justice experts in the field, and we really hope that you'll take advantage of the opportunity to come to us with any questions. Your NRC technical assistance provider will support you as you complete the planning and implementation phase deliverables um, and will also help you to complete the, your larger goals of improving your reentry process to support youth reentering the community. For example, uh, Liz or myself can come facilitate a strategic planning session or meetings of your reentry task forces. And if you'd like us to come visit to facilitate a, a session, we can talk about what an agenda might look like and how we can make the most of that meeting to really garner support and consensus from reentry task force members. We can help you identify uh, baseline recidivism rates and set improvement targets and also develop plans for tracking progress improvements. We can facilitate your assessment process and help you to diagnose the results of the checklist. We can help you use the findings from these assessments to develop plans for policy and practice improvements as well as implementation plans. We also have a wealth of resources here at the NRC and connect you with additional research um, and also examples of best practices from across the country as well as other grantees and experts that we've worked with to support your reentry reform efforts.
So the guide is divided into four sections designed to guide you as you complete the key deliverables required of all grantees in the planning phase. The first deliverable that we'll be working with you on is establishing your reentry task force. We'll help you think through the composition, structure, and operation of your reentry task force and whether the key elements are in place to ensure that it can serve as an effective planning, implementation, and oversight body. This section is designed to help you conduct a self-assessment of your task force and work together with your TA provider to identify opportunities for stronger collaboration as well as technical assistance that can support your efforts. In addition to serving as a strategic planning and implementation oversight body, a reentry task force can also promote a coordinated approach across systems for data sharing, assessment, case planning, and service delivery that reflects the research on what works to reduce recidivism rates and improve youth outcomes. To maximize the potential of your reentry task force to help systems uh, achieve improved outcomes, Jurisdictions should focus on a number of key elements of an effective reentry task force. The first element is comprehensive membership. Your reentry task force should, should reflect the broad range of state and local juvenile justice agencies, other service systems, and organizations uh, to, important to reentry planning and aftercare. It should also include the perspectives of other community stakeholders and families. Many jurisdictions already have a reentry or juvenile justice task force or advisory group in place, and the reentry task force can draw from these existing groups. The second element is making sure that members are in leadership positions and have decision-making authority. Given the role of the task force in advancing jurisdiction-wide policy and practice changes, it's critical that members possess decision-making authority on behalf of their agencies and that the task force has executive level support. Task forces should include senior staff that report to various juvenile justice stakeholders, such as agency leadership, the legislature, governor or county executives, and judges. Third, it's important that the task force establish a clear vision and mission for its work together, in addition to establishing concrete goals. It's also important that members' roles and responsibilities for advancing these goals are, are, agreed, are documented and agreed upon. Fourth, the task force should also have a clear leadership structure with a co-chair or co-chairs responsible for facilitating meetings and holding members accountable for progress. Subcommittees with, other, with, with chairs should also be developed as needed to address specific, specific areas of reentry policy and practice. The group should have a regular schedule of meetings with written agendas prepared in advance that guide these meetings. And finally, task forces will need to identify individuals who can help schedule and prepare for meetings and document key takeaways and next steps and help the task force members to advance the completion of grant deliverable. Additional resources such as space, food, and technology are also important to task force efforts. And finally, your TA provider can answer any questions that you have about the composition, structure, and elements of an effective reentry task force. And we can also help task, uh, develop task force agendas, facilitate meetings, and also provide examples of membership and materials from other jurisdictions' task forces. Your agency and reentry task force are responsible for ensuring the ultimate goal of the demonstration program, which is to achieve measurable reductions in recidivism and, improve, and improvements in youth reentry outcomes. The only way to be sure that you're making progress, to, progress towards your goals and using your time and system resources efficiently is to collect this outcome data from the outset of the initiative and at regular intervals along the way and to share this data and use the outcome data to guide ongoing policy, practice, and resource allocation decisions. Data and sustainability also go, go hand in hand, and you can use the results of this data to document successes and leverage future funding. It will also help you make informed decisions about future resource investments. 
So to maximize the potential of your data collection and analysis to document improved outcomes, grantees should focus on a number of elements, of, of key elements of tracking recidivism and other youth outcomes. First, you should identify a target population that reflects a group of moderate or high-risk offenders. The population should also be a group of offenders from the same facilities or that share similar characteristics. Second, it's important to track the many ways that youth can have contact with the juvenile justice system, including re-arrest, re-adjudication, recommitment, and technical violations. You should also plan to account for recidivism that occurs in the adult correction system and at least 12 months after, the, after juvenile justice system supervis supervision ends. We'll work with you to understand how you're, how you're currently tracking youth and what are the barriers to being able to, to do this kind of tracking and how we can help you address those barriers. Third, it will also be important to work with your task force to identify a set of positive, positive youth outcomes to track for the target population. This could include academic progress, school enrollment, and behavioral health outcomes, and outcomes and improvements. You should also work with your task force to develop annual improvement targets for recidivism rates and other youth outcomes. And these targets should be specific and ambitious, but also achievable. Baseline recidivism rates should be disaggregated by different types of recidivism and also be broken down by risk, level, risk levels. And it's important to regularly track progress and analyze the data that you've collected by different characteristics, such as demographic group, facility, length of stay, service providers, and youth needs. This can help you identify what's working for whom and where you can target your efforts to improve outcomes. Your agency should also establish a process for sharing outcome data with key stakeholders in a user-friendly way. And finally, task forces can establish a process for reviewing this data, and the data should be used to evaluate the strategic plan and make revisions to that plan and reallocate resources. Um, it should also hold task force members and other key stakeholders accountable for implementing improvement plans. So to assist you uh, with this work and effectively in building an effective tracking system, your technical assistance provider can help offer templates to support the calculation of recidivism rates. We can come uh, visit you to present on, to, to key stakeholders on best practices and also provide examples from other jurisdictions and connect you with peer learning partners. The checklist in Section 3 are designed to help you and your task force conduct a self-assessment of current reentry policies and practices and to what extent these efforts reflect the core principles on how to reduce recidivism and improve other youth reentry outcomes. Your TA provider can help you assess the results of your checklist and develop a reentry strategic plan that can address policy and practice barriers to improve youth outcomes. This section of the guide also includes a series of diagnostic questions that can help you and your task force to analyze the results of this assessment and identify the highest priority and most viable policy and practice changes. The NRC spent the last year reviewing the research and identifying core principles and associated policy and practices for what works to reduce to improve youth reentry outcomes. And the full report on the core principles for reducing recidivism, recidivism and improving other outcomes for youth in, in the juvenile justice system can be found on the youth page of our website. The NRC developed this white paper through extensive examination of the most rigorous research on juvenile justice policies and practices. And while the demonstration grant program provides an opportunity to test out new, new strategies, these new strategies should be couched within the research and these core principles. The core principles identified by research to reduce recidivism and promote positive youth outcomes help policymakers and practitioners 
to make informed decisions about how to use their resources to improve reentry outcomes for youth. So let's briefly walk through each of the four core principles. The first core principle for reducing recidivism and improving other youth reentry outcomes is for juvenile justice systems to use validated risk assessments to identify youth who are least and most likely to reoffend. Use of risk assessments is the most objective way to determine risk level and sets an, ev an evidence-based foundation for everything that follows. Juvenile justice systems should use risk assessment results to ensure that only those most likely to reoffend are confined. As you know, research shows that system involvement can have negative, a negative effect on low-risk youth. Assessments can also help determine the level of supervision that medium and high risk youth require in confinement and also guide lengths of stay and release planning. Risk assessments should also inform the frequency and intensity of supervision contacts for youth returning to the community. Systems should also use validated assessments to identify and focus the specific needs that are and, and focus on the specific needs that are the primary causes of youth delinquent behavior. Identification of the primary factors leading to youth behavior can help determine what needs, what needs should serve as the focal point for case planning and reentry services, and therefore help, your, help your jurisdiction to make the most efficient and appropriate use of available services in confinement and in the community. Principle two involves implementing programs and services that have been demonstrated by research to reduce recidivism and improve other youth outcomes. This includes both services offered to youth in residential facilities and programs to facilitate youth reentry into the community. Programs designed to promote youth's positive development, particularly uh, through cognitive, behavioral, and, and family-centric approaches have proven to have have proven to substantially reduce recidivism and improve other outcomes for high-risk youth. Juvenile justice systems should require residential facilities and community-based reentry service providers to match these services to youth needs. Systems should then use data to evaluate the resulting outcomes and make appropriate changes based on those results. An important part of this process will be assessing the service quality and fidelity to the research. Staff buy-in and training will be critical to the effective implementation of services and high quality service delivery. Principle three highlights the importance of employing a coordinated approach across service systems to address youth needs. Your reentry task force will be critical to this effort. Most of the youth who end up in confinement will have an array of challenges impacting their successful reentry. The majority of youth in confinement have a variety of needs, including mental health, substance use, child welfare, and education needs. Juvenile justice systems can improve service access and quality by collaborating with other service systems to address youth's comprehensive needs. In addition, redundancies and inefficient use of resources can be reduced when jurisdictions use a coordinated approach to service provision. Research shows that more services and system involvement does not necessarily lead to better outcomes. Youth outcomes can be best improved through the use of targeted services that address their specific criminogenic, criminogenic risk factors, and service coordination is critical to this effort. Your ability to coordinate services to address youth needs, both in facilities and when youth return to the community, will be critical in reducing recidivism and improving other youth outcomes. Principle four emphasizes the need to tailor justice system policies, programs, and supervision to reflect the developmental needs of adolescents. Research confirms that the differences between adolescents and adults are the, bio, are the result of biological and neurological conditions unique to adolescents. 
ignoring these distinct aspects of adolescent development can undermine the, the potential positive impact of system interventions. And as such, a, development, a developmentally appropriate approach to working with youth should be, should be embedded within all reentry policies, programs, and supervision for youth in the juvenile justice system. Juvenile justice systems should systematically engage families, other supportive adult, adults, and youth themselves in reentry planning and system interventions. Training and support should, should also be provided to line staff who provide super, supervision and services to youth to hone their ability to become agents of positive youth behavior change. Systems should also employ a systematic approach to providing youth with a set of incentives and graduated responses to youth behavior. And finally, juvenile justice systems should also invest in meaningful efforts to reduce system bias and disparate treatment of, of certain populations of youth to ensure that all youth are equally benefit from the juvenile justice policy reform. An important part of this work will be the use of data analysis to understand system outcomes for different characteristics of youth and using these results to inform policy and practice change. And the NRRC can help you to learn more about the core principles and provide you with further research as needed. And we're also ha happy to share examples from other jurisdictions and connect you with peer learning partners. As part of the implementation plan, it's critical that grantees plan to sustain grant activities as well as your strategic planning and reentry reform efforts to reduce recidivism and improve other youth outcomes. OJJDP is making a large investment in time and money, and the expectation is that grantees will create systemic long-term change. Sustainability is not just about obtaining funding, but also building the aspects of this process that can continue regardless of funding. The first two sections of the P&I guide, forming a task force and creating a plan to track outcome data, will both feed into your ability to, to sustain your programming. For example, data can help you make decisions about resource allocation and get stakeholder buy-in by documenting your successes. You'll consider a number of factors that influence the long-term success of your grant activities, including stakeholder engagement. The reentry task force will be critical to engaging key stakeholders. Their involvement will be important even beyond the life of the grant as you continue to work to improve reentry outcome, reentry policies and practices. In addition, many funding sources will require, will require that you have formal partnerships in place. Your agency should develop specific processes to maintain the involvement of, of the task force in advancing the implementation plan. Second, the task force should also help garner leadership support and develop ways to keep these leaders informed about progress. This can be particularly helpful if there are changes to the implementation plan that require agency leadership approval. Leadership support can also help leverage resources where needed. The buy-in of supervisors and line staff are, is also critical to ensure that reforms are implemented with fidelity to the research. Your agency and the task force should establish a plan for facilitating the buy-in of line staff on the implementation plan. And you should also develop a plan for training and supporting them in adopting those changes. Fourth, implementation progress should be tracked and the key stakeholders should be held accountable for specific deliverables and timelines. The implementation plan will outline how the changes in recidivism rates and other youth outcomes will be tracked, who will oversee this process, and how task force members and agency leaders will be held accountable for their support of these efforts. And lastly, a sustained commitment to implementation activities as well as a broader reentry policy and practice change will likely require the reallocation of existing resources or new resources. An effective implementation plan will also document the resources required to sustain these efforts and identify anticipated funding sources and amounts to support ongoing improvements to your reentry system. Your TA provider can guide you 
as you develop your sustainability and funding plans and can answer any questions about developing effective sustainability strategies. And we can provide examples of sustainability and funding plans from other jurisdictions as well. So now that we've had an opportunity to walk through the four sections of the guide, I'd like for you to hear from a grantee who's gone through the experience of actually completing the guide and incorporating the guide into their strategic plan. Shazi Jackson is a senior criminal justice analyst for the Criminal Justice Commission of Palm Beach County, a 2013 implementation grantee. If you have questions for Shazi about her experience, please be sure to type your question into the box at the bottom right-hand corner. Shazi, thank you for joining us today and agreeing to participate in the call, and I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Cynthia said, my name is Shazia Jackson, and I'm with the Palm Beach County Criminal Justice Commission, and we are recipients of the 2013 Second Chance Act grant. And I'm happy to be here today and speak with you all about um, what we call Back to the Future, which is our county's juvenile reentry initiative. And I want to talk to you more about how we actually use the planning and implementation guide as sort of a blueprint and a guide for juvenile reentry here in our county. Um, just a couple um, key points I wanted to go over with you. We use the guide to do a couple of things, one of those things being shape the juvenile reentry task force, which you all have heard numerous times during this presentation. It's really key in getting reentry going. Um, also, we use it to create a foundation for juvenile reentry, um, shape services and programming, develop processes, policies, and procedures, and then most importantly, changing agency culture within our county. Um, to start, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we utilize the guide to shape what we call our um, Palm Beach County Juvenile Reentry Task Force. Um, the task force was developed in 2012, and it really began to take form in 2013 when we started to work on this planning and implementation guide. On our task force, um, like you heard earlier, it's very important to have key people and leaders in your task force that can make the decisions. Um, and so we have much of our 15 judicial circuit on the task force. We have the public defender's office, the state attorney's office, our Department of Juvenile Justice chief probation officer, um, Department of Corrections, Palm Beach County Sheriff's office. We also have our school district. Um, we also have Palm Beach County's legis legislative affairs rep. Um, we have mental health and behavioral health agencies. We have um, our DCF department, which is Department of Children and Families. We have faith-based organizations and then other community providers as well. And we're actually lucky here in Palm Beach County because our task force is actually chaired by our circuit's administrative juvenile judge, um, Judge Kathleen Kroll, and she plays a major role in coordinating a lot of our task force um, initiatives and our goals and holding a lot of the um, members accountable for their task as well. Um, we use the PNI guide um, also as a tool to decide who would be on the task force. Even though we had one formed, it helped us to really bring the right people around the table. Um, we found that the individuals who were able to help complete the guide were actually the best ones to serve on the actual task force. Um, so in doing so, we were able to bring together individuals not only from our juvenile justice system, but also from the community. So we brought together a lot of community providers that have very um, good input as far as juvenile reentry. Um, and just moving on a little bit, we also use the P&I guide um, as a way to create sort of a foundation for juvenile reentry in our county and a, a starting point. Um, to do so, while we were going through the guide, we were able to kind of pick out the gaps that we had in our system, strengths that we didn't really recognize, but we were like, wow, we were really good at a lot of things and we wanted to improve on those things. And then also weaknesses and areas that we needed to improve on. So in doing so, what we did was we used the guide as like a blueprint um, for an initiative, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit, and developed what we call our juvenile reentry st strategic plan. So as you heard earlier, you have to come up with some kind of a plan as to how you're going to implement your, um, your project. And so that's what we kind of um, did. And so this plan allows our task force to prioritize their task. So kind of figure what needs to happen first and then what needs to go next. And also to find creative ways to address the gaps in our system. Um, we also use this plan to map out how to better use our strengths. So the things that we're really good at, we use our plan to actually see how we can actually do more of those things. Um, also, the P&I guide is also instrumental in 
what we kind of used it for was to help shape what we call our reentry services. So what are services looking like for our youth? We were able to use that P&I guide, come up with what those services needed to be and add them into our strategic plan. So some of the major things we identified as far as gaps in services, um, we noticed there was a huge need for cognitive behavioral programs in the community. Um, a lot of our youth were getting it while in residential commitment, but there were a few that may not have gotten it and they got into the community and we noticed that we didn't have anyone in the community that would provide it. So we also noticed that there were not a lot of programming for um, targeted spe um, specific age groups. So a lot of our younger kids would be in the same programs as the older kids. Um, and then we also noticed that there was a lack of engagement as far as the families and youth within a timely manner. Um, so as a result, um, what we did, we went back and like I said, we have our plan. So we, we identified that we definitely needed cognitive behavioral programming and so we've implemented aggression replacement training for our higher risk youth. And we also implement another evidence-based life skills program um, for our younger youth. And we also implement a program called Choice to Change 102, which enhances our family um, engagement and the youth engagement as well. And all these efforts are a part of um, our Back to the Future initiative, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about in a minute. Um, the guide also played a major role in the development of our processes. So we dealt, de developed many processes within um, our organization to kind of make sure it went smoothly. We also came with policies and procedures. Um, so the first thing we did was we created a pro policy and procedure manual. And this manual basically outlined staff roles, provider roles, services that we would be provided, the referral process, um, the reentry process for our youth returning to our county, and it also outlined um, how we would collect data. Um, here in Palm Beach County, we have Renew, which is our reentry network database, and so within our policy and procedure manual, we clearly state when things should be entered and what should be entered. So we found that that is a huge help as far as the data collection and entry process. Um, in addition to this, we also came up with a, um, a neat little flow chart that I'll show you in a minute, which we are able to share amongst ourselves, and it kind of keeps everything in order, and it highlights the different key reentry points for our youth as they go through the initiative. Um, and kind of to complement the process and to add more processes into the picture, um, we conduct what we call transition staffing. So these are staffings that happen prior to youth coming out. It's like a treatment team. We get together, we discuss the youth's needs, the youth has in, um, input. We also try to engage the parents early on in the pre-release stage. And then we also have, once the kids come home, is an intake team um, out in the community, kind of like a welcome home com um, committee for when our youth get home. So these are just some of the um, key points that we have developed along the way where we've seen where actually gaps. Um, in addition to all these things, I think one of the most important things we were able to do was kind of change the um, agency culture. Um, and by changing culture, I mean changing the way our community and our juvenile justice agencies viewed this thing called re recall reentry. Um, in using the guide, we were able to bring staff, stakeholders um, together to basically discuss best practices in juvenile reentry and what would work here in our county. And we began this process with um, the help of our Council of State Government's technical assistant who came down here to Palm Beach and was able to help us coordinate what we call the reentry roundtable. And this was early on in our development, so it was perfect timing. And, and from then on, it, that has sparked many discussions um, as far as how to utilize best practices for our youth. And we found that a lot of these hot topics actually kept our um, community providers and our stakeholders interested um, in reentry. And we're also able to train community providers. Um, we use the positive achievement change tool, which is our assessment we use to assess our youth for risk. And so by training our providers in how to read and understand that tool, we were able to show them that you have to address the criminogenic needs and provide the appropriate treatment. Um, traditionally, kids get out and you just provide treatment that you think fits best, but we were able to train and um, show our community providers that based on this assessment tool, a transition plan should be developed based on their criminogenic needs. So this definitely helped us gain buy-in from our community providers, especially buying and utilizing a risk assessment tool to actually drive services. Um, so we found that educate, educating the staff and our stakeholders in the community actually brought about increase. So the more they knew, the more they bought into reentry. I mean, as, as time goes by, we are noticing that more and more individuals are informed about the benefits of reentry and kind of steering away from their traditional um, beliefs on how youth should be released into the community. This is um, this is a sample of our Back to the Future um, flowchart. So this is what I was talking about earlier, and it kind of outlines 
um, the Back to the Future reentry process. And this is a product of our Juvenile Reentry Task Force. And as the result of the gaps we identified using the PNI guide and with the task force, we were able to come up with this initiative. And so basically the Back to the Future initiative um, is the reentry process for our juveniles returning to Palm Beach County. Um, and we provide services from case management all the way to transitional housing. And like I said earlier, aggression replacement, cognitive behavioral, educational services. But this kind of shows you starting from day one how the youth would flow as far as their transition. So during our implementation phase of this initiative, we use um, the guide to create a formal reentry process for all juveniles returning from residential commitment programs. So this flows chart represents the process youth go through during their journey home. Um, you'll notice that the flow chart is broken into three phases, kind of similar to the ones mentioned in the P&I guide. Um, and you also notice that this process begins at commitment and continues into the youth stay in the community. Um, development of this chart is just one of the many ways we actually use the guide to kind of organize and structure um, our reentry efforts here in Palm Beach County. Um, so this um, concludes my section. I just wanted to share my experience with you all as far as how we experienced the P&I Guide here in Palm Beach County. I know it can be a little bit overwhelming at first when you're looking at it, but if you really sit down and bring the right people to the table, it will allow your justice system to flow a lot better. And like Cynthia uh, mentioned before, just be honest on the guide. Um, I think when you're honest, you actually are a better able to identify the gaps and then find true results as far as fixing what the problems are. And then also reach out to your Council of State Government's um, technical assistant. They've been a huge help to us, and I believe if you reach out to them, if you have any issues, they can definitely help you at least figure out where to start. Um, so I thank you. If you have any questions for me, my contact information is up on the screen. Please feel free to call me or email me. If there are any documents you would like me to share with you, I'll be more than happy to. Thank you. So Shazi, thank you so much for sharing your experience with the group. It was really valuable to hear about your process, that, the process that you took as an agency, and I'm sure it'll definitely be relevant to the grantees on the call. So thank you so much. And again, if you have questions for Shazi about her experience or any questions about the P&I guide, please type your question into the box at the bottom right-hand corner. So now we can talk a little bit about um, immediate next steps. So I've been in contact with all of you to schedule our first two calls, and many of you will be speaking with me this week and next to have our introductory call to review your reentry process and the proposed scope of work. On January 30th, you'll be submitting checklists one and two, and we will talk before then so that I can support you in that process. I'll also be available, of course, in between calls to discuss improvements needed to your reentry task force and data tracking systems. And you'll be engaging with your reentry task force as well throughout this process. As a reminder, it's not too late to ask your questions, and we encourage you to type your questions into the, bo into the box on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. But before we turn to those questions, I'd like to address some, some of the common questions that grantees ask about the P&I guide process. So the first question is, will OJJDP look at your completed P&I guide? And if so, how will they be using your response? So yes, the completed P&I guides will be a requirement to move on to the implementation phase of your grant. So OJJDP will be seeing them. And the completed guide is evidence of being ready to move forward to the implementation phase. It shows that you worked with the NRC to develop an implementation plan that reflects, the collabor that reflects this collaboration. And you'll not receive your implementation funding until the guide is, is complete. However, it's important to keep in mind that it's to your benefit, as, as Shazi um, emphasized, to be as honest as possible in responding to the questions in the checklist. What OJJDP wants to see is that you really took the P&I guide process seriously, um, and the purpose of the guide is really to assist you in preparing for the successful implementation of your scope of work that's outlined in your proposals, as well as to identify reentry policy and practice change. So the second question is, what if we cannot get everyone to the table who should complete the guide in time? 
Um, so you should make your best effort to get key stakeholders to, to the table to complete the guide. However, if you're un unable to get everyone to the table for this process, you should go ahead and move forward and get started. Um, the reentry task force is in, does not need to be a, a static group, and you can utilize task force members to bring on other stakeholders to the table. So assessment can also be done on an ongoing basis and can be revisited over a period of time. The third question is, can we clarify the link between the P&I guide and the implementation and technical assistance plan? Your TA provider will work with you and your task force to collaboratively identify a small number of priority and practice changes within each section of the planning and implementation guide. And the results of the of planning activities will culminate in the implementation and technical assistance plan. This plan will guide the technical assistance that you'll receive from the NRC throughout your implementation phase, and other, as well as the assistance that you can receive from other experts to accomplish the goals determined in the planning phase. It'll also help you to review the progr your progress toward these goals and track the completion status of the tasks that you've identified. The fourth question is, can we complete the planning phase in more or less than six months to receive implementation funding? So if your jurisdiction has some of the elements of the planning phase already in place, such as a reentry task force or a reentry strategic plan, that, that will allow us to get through the elements of the guide more quickly than other jurisdictions. However, you'll still be required to complete the guide to receive your implementation funding. You'll use the guide to work with your TA provider to identify priority policy and practice changes and determine how we at the NRC can best assist you throughout that process. Josh or Liz, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, I guess I would just like to reiterate um, that really the, this uh, grant, and particularly the planning phase, but certainly also the implementation phase, really offers all of you an opportunity beyond just um, receiving some critical funding to support your reentry needs. Um, hopefully, as you've heard from Shazi and as we've uh, tried to emphasize throughout this webinar, um, it's really our mission at the National Reentry Resource Center uh, to help you uh, identify and, and make changes that will sustainably improve your broader reentry policies and practices in a way that can have a permanent impact on recidivism and other outcomes for youth that you serve. Um, and and we, we have experience doing that with grantees and also working uh, with just states and counties across the country to reform their juvenile justice systems. And so we really really encourage you to, to think of this grant opportunity um, as a chance for that kind of systems reform and to uh, not hesitate to engage with us um, to think through how we can help you um, share some of this information with senior level uh, folks within your agency or other government officials. Uh, to help you identify what those critical and strategic opportunities are for, for that reform, to facilitate um, meetings and discussions and presentations to identify the, the opportunities to get better outcomes and use resources more efficiently, and for us to actually help you advance needed reforms, whether they're at the agency level or at the policy level. Um, and so really the, the, the opportunities for this grant and for that kind of policy change are really up to you in terms of um, your, your, uh, your time and the effort and the, the partnership that you want to have with us to engage in those kinds of reforms. It's our mission. We're excited to have the opportunity to do that with you, and we hope you'll really take us up on that offer. Great. Thanks, Josh. Um, and will that, with that, we'll respond to any questions that you may have for today's panelists.
So we didn't receive any additional questions, but we'll definitely make ourselves available after the webinar for any questions you may have. And you should feel free to call me or email me at any time with any questions. As you exit the webinar, a short survey will automatically appear to ask you about your experience on the webinar. We really use this feedback to improve our services and very much appreciate your taking a couple of seconds to complete the questions that will appear. Thanks again to Josh and Shazi for participating on the call. And congratulations again to everyone on receiving this award, and I'm really looking forward to continuing our work together. Thank you.